Hello, I'm Atuba Judge, and I'm so glad to be bringing God's truth to you today. Now, this is a new week, and hey, this is the last week of the month of April. Praise God. And the Lord told us in this month, He is visiting His children. Now, when we say God is visiting, you know, sometimes I wonder what people think. And that's what I've been talking about from the beginning of the month. The purpose of God is to visit you to confirm the blessing that he promised Abraham. And I told you the reason for that blessing, or the final part of that blessing, is that through the seed of Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that's what we've been talking about all month. And I've showed you several aspects of this and trying to get you to understand the blessing. Then we entered into the covenant that God made with Abraham to enforce the blessing. Praise God. As we go on this week, I pray that the Spirit of God will give you clear understanding in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we go into the broadcast today, can we do what the Lord commanded us to do on this broadcast? Can we call for that daily bread? It's a demand Jesus asks us to make. And let's make it in faith and see God meet your needs today. Are you ready? Join me in faith right now and say this word. Say, Father, I make the demand for my daily bread right now. And I receive all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. When you make this declaration, expect a miracle. Someone say, must I be expecting a miracle every day? Brothers and sisters, as God's children, we breathe miracle. Miracle is an everyday expectation in your life. Now, I've heard people say miracle is a divine intervention in earthly affairs. Now, that definition might just have a little challenge with it because it sounds like when things are so hard, then you need that divine intervention. No, sir. Miracle is, for a child of God, miracle is a normal thing. You know why? Because we live in two worlds. We are in this world, but we are not from here. I want that to sink in your heart. We are here, but we are not from here. So because we live here, it is normal. It is, it is proper for that intervention to be happening every now and then. Hey, it can be happening every day. God fed the children of Israel for 40 years, every day non-stop except the Sabbath days, with manna, food that they did not know about. Every morning. Now, that, now that's, not a, that's not how the earth was functioning. See? But because of God's children, there was supply of food every day for 40 years. Not 40 days, not 40 weeks, 40 years. Three uh, 65 days, like I said, except Sundays, except the Sabbath days, excuse me, except the Sabbath days, they had supply. Now, even for the Sabbath day, they had double supply on the day before the Sabbath day. Praise God. So now they had enough. There was none that went hungry. There was none that complained about anything. They were living by that, if you call it divine intervention, straight for 40 years. It wasn't a problem to God. So quit thinking, if I had a job, you know, you know, people say, now, now, well, how do you, you lost your job? Yeah, so how do you survive? They say, ah, it's just the grace of God. Though. Wow. You know, say, wow. Well, I pray you soon get a job. Now, when you make statements like that, how are you surviving? You say, it's the grace of God that has been keeping me. That's right. That's normal for a believer. What's going to keep you in the first place? Now, we make that sound like because I didn't, I don't have a job right now, I have to live by the grace of God. Now, that's an error in thoughts, in, in, in your way of thinking. So, what happens? Now, brother, can you, can you just, you know, help me put a word for me? Let me get a job in that place. You know, right now, I'm just living by the grace of God. Hey, so when I help you get a job, what happens to the grace of God? 
Even when you ask, you know what I'm talking about? No, excuse me. Do you want to walk out of the grace of God? Hey, everything we do is by the grace of God. Whether you have a job or not, is by the grace of God. And listen, whether you have a job or you don't have a job, you ought to still be living by faith. If you have a job, you need to know. Now, faith, faith will teach you how to appropriate your funds. Not because you have a job, you begin to live anyhow. You've got to learn soberness, financial soberness. Now, financial soberness is when you have money, but then you are sober about your spending. You don't just go spending because you have so much money. You are still running things from the Lord to know what you should spend money on. Because the fact that you have money doesn't stop the angels from supplying what you need. Now, that's the mystery of the Christian walk. But lots of God's children enjoy this uh, miracle of supply. But in their mind, it is just an intervention until they get a job. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Now, that's why I'm showing you the Abrahamic blessing. That God had a covenant with Abraham after he had promised to bless him. He had, had actually made a covenant with him. And the covenant stated that, look, I will be responsible for your sustenance. You need to check your life. And there are things you need to repent of. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Some of you need to repent for years of walking or living out of faith and trust in the Lord. You think it's for broke people? You think it's for people that don't have jobs? You can depend your life on faith. Without faith, you can never please God. The question is, how well do you want to please God? If you want to ever please God, it's got to be by faith. What does it mean by faith? Waiting for God's word to come to you consigning everything. So what do you mean everything? Everything? Yes, everything. You don't want to live life in vain. See that now? You don't want to live life in vain. You don't want to finish doing life and then you wake up one day and the Lord tells you, sorry, you never lived before me. Is that what you want? You may have everything. When Jesus said, what shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his soul? What was Jesus referring to? He wasn't referring to a man who, who, who missed heaven. No. You're, you are supposed to be in charge of your soul. When you get to that point where you are now being controlled by something else and not you, you are already beginning to lose your soul. Take note of that. When money begins to influence you, how does money influence you? Now, because you have money, see, you begin to allow the money to dictate what you do. So the times you don't have money, you step down from those things. So your life keeps going. It means you're being influenced. Being influenced by money doesn't only, I'm not only talking about the people that have it. Even those that don't have it are still influenced by money. Say how? The fact that you're making decisions because you don't have money means you are influenced by money. Jesus taught the, taught the disciples to beware of covetousness. And then Jesus said, because a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. Now then, when you talk about covetousness, people just think about those people who have. So, hey, don't, don't be covetous. So you think covetous means trying to pack everything. No, no, no. Covetousness simply means the thinking in your mind that because of what you have you are something hey covetousness also means having the thinking that because you don't have something you are nothing you are covetous though you are broke you're still covetous you may be rich and still be covetous 
if you sit down and you tell yourself wow i've saved up to one billion so i don't have to work again for the rest of my life i'll just sit down there and be spending my money i'll be spending this amount every day for the rest of my life and i'll not go broke you're covetous and he thought of thinking ah if I can just get that job, then I'll be able to buy that car. If I can just get that job, ah, when I land, they will now know that somebody has come. You're covetous. The fact that you are thinking that your life consists of what you can get or what you already have means you're covetous. And Jesus told us, beware. Why? Because covetousness will make you lose your soul. That's the truth. Covetousness will make you lose your soul. That's the reason God gave us all those promises. To make us to avoid covetousness. Because he wants us to be content. Hebrews, he told us in Hebrews 13. He says, to be content, we should be content with what we have. Why? Because he has said. Hallelujah. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Let me show you that scripture so you understand. Now, I love that scripture because that's one of my best. If you ask me truly, what's your best scripture in the Bible? I'll tell you. Without thinking twice, praise God. I'll tell you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse, let's start from verse 5. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Let your way of life, let the way you conduct yourself be clearly seen that it is without covetousness, that it doesn't have any covetousness in it. Why? It says, be content with such things as you have. Is this saying you should live the life of a mediocre? No. Oh, I'm just, I'm content to me. I'm content. See, the fact that I only have one bicycle, I'm content to, I don't expect anything more. This bicycle, I will fix it, I will repair it. I will like, ah, uh ah, -uh, that's not what God is expecting you to do. What does it mean be content with something as you have? Question is, what do you have? Look at what he said in the next, the next, the next phrase there. He says, thank you, Holy Spirit. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What do you have? I have him. <laughs> oh yes, we have him. He has told us he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Why? So we may boldly declare, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. The reason for people getting covetous is simply fear. But then he tells you that God has made a promise to always be with you. So you will be bold enough to say, the Lord is my helper. So instead of thinking, hmm, only if I had a car, these people would have respected me. I know there's a temptation to think like that. But hey, he's with me. So if I want a car, I can ask him for one. Father, you've seen everything that's going on. I need a car right now. Why do you need a car? I just need a car. I just need a car. It will make life easy for me. I'll go faster to where I need to go to. I just need it. Not because, can't you see, Lord, everybody is shaming me because I don't have one. Now you're living your life for people. It's leading to covetousness and it's leading you to lose your soul. Because now you are scared of what people think about you. Oh, if I go to that place without a car, they will know that I don't have a car. So when they know that I don't have a car, they will respect me less than I am. You are worried about what men will do to you. That's exactly what he says you shouldn't do. Whatever you need, 
He is there with you. A sure promise is given to us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Why? He wants you to boldly say. So if someone says to you, why don't you have a car yet? Hey, I think I know what to do. I'm going to ask God to give me a car. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. He is my helper. And whatever I need, he gives it to me. And then you turn it to him and watch him do the miracle. Oh, I've been asking God for this for what? Hey, Harry, have you really asked? You know the truth about prayer? A lot of God's children think they pray, but they don't. You see, when you are not willing to subject yourself to the outcome of the prayer you pray, then you're not praying. Because when you pray, the first thing that is going to change from the prayer is you. If your prayer is effective, then you will know by the way it is affecting you first. Yeah. If your prayer is not affecting you, I'm sorry to say, you are now not about to see anything change. So when you kneel to pray, take note of the instructions that are coming to you. Take note of the enlightenment that is coming to you when you're praying. It is in the place of prayer you suddenly hear, you need to forgive so and so person. Ah, oh yeah. Now you've held grudges against that person for maybe months or maybe years. But in the place of prayer, but that's not what I'm even praying about. Lord, but you need to forgive this person. Oh, okay. Okay. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, I forgive this person. I forgive that person right now. Then you hear the voice of Lord say, take your phone and call the person. Ah, Lord, must I? Yes, do it. Then you take your phone and you call the person and you settle it. Now what's going on? You were praying. Something is happening. Hey, when you see things like that happen, then you know the physical situation is about to change. So when you pray, take note of that thing that the Lord is ministering to you in your heart. That is the first place you see the impact of your prayer. If you think you will just be yourself and pray, God, God, you know my problem. My problem is just that I need more money. If I can just get more money, if you can help me start that business, if you can help me get that job, I will serve you for the rest. You're not ready yet. Those are false things people say. Praise God. But I tell you this, because he loves you, he made this promise. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So you will boldly declare. And that's what God is interested in. How did you get your car? The Lord helped me. How did you get your house? The Lord helped me. How did you get married? The Lord helped me. How are you taking care of your children? The Lord helped me. How are you living? The Lord is my helper. Praise God. Oh, yes, he's my helper. And why say I will not fear what any man will do? Because I listen to only him. You remember Jesus. Now end here because my time is up. When the devil tempted him to say, Look, all these things I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, what was the devil telling him to do? To begin to fear, to begin to come into that place of anxiety where he would now step out to do things for himself. And Jesus said, no, it has been said. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you will serve. Praise God. That's what Jesus told him. I've made up my mind. I will not fear anything. Why? Because the Lord is my helper. Hey, can you make that same declaration right now? Say with me, say, I've made up my mind. I will fear nothing and no one because the Lord is my helper. And I pray for you right now. Receive help from the Lord today. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you're doing, whatever you are doing, receive help from the Lord. I see a man, you're, 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 you're having a building project. There's a building project that's going on um, from you. There's a project, something you're building, and it's been stalled for some months now. And sincerely speaking, you don't know what to do. 
hey, this week, there's an opening that is coming from the Lord. And the Lord says, I should tell you, he will help you. There's a particular man you've been chasing. But he's supposed to do something for you, open a door for you. But you've not really gotten headway. The Lord says, I should tell you, it is not from that man that your help is coming from. Turn to him, that's turn to the Lord, and let him help you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I pray for everyone right now. Receive help from God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye.